I figured out which button to press. Good morning, good afternoon, good evening to everybody. Hello, uh, my name is Dr. Julian Davis. I'm the principal of Abbey College here in Cambridge. That's the building right behind me there in sunny Cambridge. Um, it actually is a beautiful day, even though that is a photograph. The sun is shining, it's gonna be 28 degrees, perfect English summer weather, it's lovely here. So I'm joined by my esteemed colleague, Liz Elam. Uh, Liz, say hello. Hello, hi everybody. My name's Liz Elam and I'm principal at Abbey College Manchester. Likewise, we have a sunny day. Uh, so we are going to send you sunshine through our presentation. Look forward to speaking to you later on. Thanks, Julian. Brilliant, okay. So um, what we're going to do today is discuss what's on your screen right now. I hope you can see the screen. Um, I'm going to run this um, through the presentation slides on your screen there. Um, and Liz and I will take turns today to talk you through some of the things that we think are important um, about getting into medical school. Um, so we are going to wait for a few moments more for one or two more people to join and then we'll get started. So just while we're waiting for a few more moments, let me just tell you a little bit about myself. Um, I joined the college uh, that I now am the principal of um, some years ago now, over 20 years ago, remarkably. Um, and I joined that college because I wanted to help students with A-level studies and ultimately go to very fine universities. And that's the college that I now run. And our role really is to help students gain access to the toughest courses in the UK and beyond. Um, this includes medicine, as no doubt you're aware. Um, in my school also, some of our students uh, go to Cambridge and Oxford University every year. About a third of our students go to the UK's top five universities. So that's quite an achievement. So I'm gonna talk to you um, about some of the issues about getting into medical school. So hopefully now um, I'll be able to move my screen. There you go. So, the talk today is gonna to have four parts. You can see on the screen there, I'm gonna start off saying hello, introduction. I'm gonna talk you through the roots. How do you actually become a doctor? How do we prepare students? And what have students achieved? So we're gonna look at uh, Liz's college and my college uh, just for one year, for last year, to see what happened for students aiming to get to medical school. Okay, let's move on. So, this is just a reminder at the start of what I've mentioned, who we are. That's me at the top there, Julian Davis. That's Liz, principal of Abbey College Manchester. And we are part of a group. There are actually three colleges. There's another college in our group called DLD. So together we are Abbey DLD group of colleges. And together uh, we have about a thousand students. Um, Probably about 800 of those are international students, um, students perhaps such as yourself, um, who've joined us to do courses like GCSE, uh, perhaps English courses. A lot of students do A-level and foundation with us. So, so that's uh, what we offer. Um, we have something of a history. I'll tell you of that in a minute about medicine. Um, here we can see the picture on your screen on the top left. That's Abbey College, Cambridge, and that Maybe the image that you can see behind me now. Uh, and Liz's College is on the top right, Abbey College, Manchester. And you can see our sister in London, DLD College is in that little circle. And you may immediately recognise uh, the city of London there, some of the iconic images. So at the bottom left of that picture, that's the Houses of Commons, House of Commons. And you can probably make out Big Ben and the London Eye. So that's the River Thames as well. So you can see the three colleges are offering um, quite extraordinary locations. So if you were looking at coming over, you could study in the centre of London, the centre of Manchester, or in the University City of Cambridge. There we go. Okay, the routes to becoming a doctor. Right, this is where we need to work out how it is you can become a doctor from now. As a teenager, perhaps, in your country, how do you become a, a consultant in your 30s, or a GP, perhaps? Well, let's have a look. So I've, I've allocated the section on the left-hand side of your screen for you to look at the academic route. So how do you get through? And then we'll have a quick look at the visa route because it may be that you require a study visa and that's something that's concerning you and worrying you. So we can talk about that. 
So pre-university simply means the course you need to do to get into a medical school in the UK or beyond. So you can see there, there are broadly two routes that we offer. A-level, which is the UK's sort of standard examination that British students do when they're about 18, 19 years old. Or there's something called an international foundation program, which is an alternative course for students who do that instead of the last year of A-level. IELTS, you may already know, that's an English language exam. In other words, as an international student, you have to get good grades, A's, 70% plus, and you have to have pretty strong command of the English language. Now, the reason you need a strong command of the English language, if it's not obvious to you, it's because this degree, when you go to university for medicine, involves speaking to patients and you will be in the UK probably, so those patients will expect you to be fluent in English. So technically you'll be an advanced speaker, not fluent, but at this point, it's important. That's the message, English is important. Getting into university, we'll talk about that, and I know that's one of the reasons I think you're probably on this uh, webinar today, to, to learn some of the secrets maybe, of how to get into medical school. If you get in, it's five or six years, depending on the university. You're not a qualified doctor though, you're not finished, you're a junior doctor, you're qualified as a junior doctor, but you have to undergo further training. And we call that foundation years. So you're now a junior doctor, you're working in hospitals on two years called F1 and F2. Okay, that can be done in the UK. Then you specialize, three more years to be a GP, so in the UK, these are the people that work in clinics and they look after primary care. In other words, they tend to be the first doctors that people see who then get help and perhaps maybe get referral to specialists in hospitals. And um, the senior specialists are consultants. So perhaps if you were looking at being a surgeon, ultimately you're looking at becoming a consultant surgeon. So the route there is another five to eight years. So this is quite a commitment if you are looking to be a consultant, because if you add all, up, add all the, um, the, the years up, let's say it's eight years plus two, that's 10 plus five plus your A-levels. 17 years, extraordinary. And you might think, do I wanna spend 17 years studying? Well, you will be studying, but you'll also, for the foundation and specialism years, be working and you will be paid, you're an employee, you'll be earning as you go through a pretty good wage if you do this in the UK. Which brings me on to visas. So when you study for your A-levels, you are a student. Um, usually students start their A-levels uh, before the age of 18, so they're still a child in the eyes of the UK law, so you have a child visa. That visa could be extended until you're 18, 19 perhaps when you're at this pre-university course. So this is our business. This is what Liz's school and my school do. We do the A-levels, we do foundation, and we do English. So that is what we will be involved with, is the, this first stage where you'll be a tier four child. For those of you who are a bit more technical and savvy, if you're slightly older, you may actually start on a tier four general. For our purposes, it doesn't matter because Liz's school and my school and our sister in DLD in London will sponsor you. So that's how you get that first visa, okay? Sponsorship is, um, it's relatively straightforward and we always have students successfully gaining visas because we have a very good um, support administrative function. And we work very well with our third party uh, valued partners, the agents that we sometimes use. Um, in fact, we regularly use, I have to say, they're fantastic. Moving on, when you go to university, you're still on a student visa. This is almost automatic. There's a process of application, but if you're in medical school, if you have a place, you will get a tier four general. It's highly likely. We've not, I've, I've never heard of any student who's been refused uh, when they have a place for, for university, particularly for a medical degree. Then you've done, your, you've done your five years, you've been paying for this education, of course, because you're still a student. You've then qualified as a junior doctor. You then start earning money. You're, you're now working in hospitals on those foundation years, but you're still on a tier four general. That's a student visa and it's automatic. You will get that. And you might think, well, will the UK government absolutely give me that tier four general? Does the government want me 
to stay? And the answer is, yes, please. Probably this is the same in many countries now. We don't have enough doctors in the UK. There's a shortage of qualified people across the world. So the reason we will automatically give you this tier four general for the foundation years is because we want you to stay. You're highly qualified now. You're valuable to the UK and we want you to stay. Please work in our hospitals. We've trained you for five years. Please stay at least for two. We'll give you the visa, it's yours and you learn money. So it's a very attractive uh, opportunity, I think, for international student to get at least two years of training paid in the UK on a visa. If you then decide to stay and specialize in the UK, the government will also bend over backwards to keep you here. So you'll get a tier four, a, a tier two, sorry, this is a, a visa now of somebody working because of course you have already been working. The government wants you to stay. So the simple message is, look at the timeline. It is long and involved, but after university you're employed and the UK government view medic students very favorably. We are very keen on international people working in our health sector. Uh, we have a shortage in many areas. We'd love you to, to work and help our hospitals and help our people here. So that's the route. Okay, I'm going to move on now. So hopefully that is uh, something you've, you've got a bit more understanding of. How do we prepare medical students? Well, let's just go back and remember that there are three colleges in this group. This is College in Manchester, mine in Cambridge, and our colleague runs a DLD College in London. And you can see, quite interestingly, both the Manchester and the Cambridge College were established and mine was 26 years ago, Liz is 30 years ago, uh, I think 29 actually, she can confirm. And we were, we were established to help students get to medical school. That was it. That was our rationale. Help students get into the hardest course to get into. So we've, we've had this specialty for, for decades now and it stayed with us. Uh, we now offer this specialty to students from all around the world. When we started, it was mostly British students. Now, my college particularly is fully international. So this is what this, inter this expertise is now offered to for international students. Okay, we have retained and extended our medical expertise. Okay, so next thing I'm going to talk to you about is the routes. Remember that pre-university route to get to university the stage that I think you're probably at now. How do you get in? How do you show universities high grades? And then we'll get on to, well, how do you successfully win a place with your high grades? So I'm going to talk you through the A-level route. This is, in the UK, the more common of the two routes because this is what British students all do pretty much. They do A-level. It's the examination that I took when I was your age. Um, so that's why I've described it as the traditional route. Um, three A-levels are required. There are some students I meet who are very ambitious, very bright, keen to impress, and they say, I want to do six A-levels or five A-levels. And that's really admirable, but you don't need to. Um, in my school, we actually start with four for most students, but that's they're really for us to work with the student to work out which are the best three. So it takes us maybe half a term, maybe seven weeks, maybe a, maybe a full term, maybe 12, 13, 14 weeks, maybe the first year to find out, well, should you do all four? Or is it, is it physics you should stop? Or, or maybe it's mathematics you should stop. You've got to keep your chemistry and your biology there. So chemistry, biology, a science subject in addition or a mathematics uh, subject. So you can see there, biology, chemistry, maths. Um, on the subject of A-level choice for medicine, it is, it is that straightforward. You have to do biology, chemistry. I would suggest either maths, uh, physics, or another science like psychology. If you're choosing four subjects, don't think further maths is of much help because it's your fourth A-level, and if you were going to drop a subject, it would have to be further maths. So you can choose further maths, but remember, if you're going to lose one, it will be that, because you have to do biochemistry, single maths. Three A-grades typically required. 
you should aim for higher than that, A star. And A levels, it's a full academic program for two years. Um, we actually offer it as a, a slightly shorter course as well, over 18 months, and we have an accelerated component over that. You can get into medical schools uh, pretty much anywhere in the world. All UK medical schools will accept you with your A levels. So that's the first route. Um, now, I'm going to pass you over to Liz because we've also um, uh, worked on our own alternative route, which is called the International Foundation Programme, and Liz is the expert. So I'm now going to pass you over to Liz. I'm going to switch myself off. Thank you, Julian. Hello again. So, um, so far you've looked at, you know, the routes to into medicine and looked at the A-level route. Now, um, the International Foundation Programme Medicine Pathway is an alternative route into medicine. Now, as Julian explained, both our colleges were started, were established because of people wanting to reset their A-levels to get into medicine. Now, for us, we're actually 30 years old this September. Um, you know, things have moved on. We still get students coming to resit to get into medicine with A-levels. And we offer two-year A-level programme and we have international and home domestic students on that programme. However, for international students who are on a tier four visa, you have an alternative pathway that you can follow. So I'm just going to run through the structure the universities that accept the program and the main advantages and disadvantages of the International Foundation along with the entry criteria. So first of all, let's take a look at the structure. Now, surprise, surprise, the two main subjects in the structure are biology and chemistry. And so basically you take three units of uh, biology, three units of chemistry, and two units of mathematics or physics. So again, you can see the pattern of subjects is very similar to that which Julian described. Now, instead of this programme being graded from A star to E, this programme is graded as a percentage score, which means that you're aiming for between 70% and 75% or higher, uh, obviously in terms of what you want to achieve, but in terms of reaching the benchmarks of the universities, it's 70% to 75% overall in the programme. Now, this means that you aren't competing with anyone else for the grade. You are simply going to try and get that grade yourself. Now, if we look at the slide here, we can see that Aston University requires 75%, UCLan requires 70%, and St George's University in Grenada requires 75%. So that just gives you an overview of what you're aiming for. If we can just go back to the previous slide, Julian, if that's okay. You can then see that the, the makeup of the programme. So biology, 37.5%, chemistry, 37.5%, maths or physics, 25%. Now, alongside the teaching of the biology, chemistry, maths or physics, we also run a med medicine preparation programme. So that will prepare students for interview, it will prepare students for knowledge of uh, medicine and what it is to be a doctor. Now, in actual fact, Julia's going to talk a bit more about medical preparation later because uh, we have a common approach to that, you know, in terms of how we operate that between the colleges, the same kinds of areas are covered. Now, alongside the IFP programme, IELTS lessons are offered. A lot of students that do the International Foundation programme still require IELTS. The minimum requirement to get in is 6.5 and 6.0, ideally to get onto our course, but you are going to need 7 to 7.5 to get onto the courses that accept the programme. So IELTS is still an important component of the course, but it's not scored as part of the programme. Now, the other difference, the main difference with the International Foundation Medicine Pathway, apart from the fact that it's a one year programme, is that it is still a modular programme. So you take the exams in December, March and June. Now, this is more friendly for international students, particularly if you are still developing your English skills, particularly your written skills, your writing skills, your reading skills, you know, that, that does make it more friendly to you. And you can actually retake up to two units in the summer series in June. 
So that is another advantage as your English develops, as you're, you know, getting used to the system in the UK, all of those things develop, you've got that chance to resit. A levels, of course, are taken at the end of the program, one sitting, and that's it at the end of two years. Now, as I've said before, all the unit scores and final score are presented as a percentage. So if we return to the next slide, we can see the universities that accept the program for medicine. So I just want to emphasize for medicine. So there are three universities in the UK that accept for medicine. Obviously, this does limit choice, and I suppose this is one of the main disadvantages of taking the pathway. However, the success rate of students getting into one of these universities is very high. And by doing this pathway, you can reduce the risk from compared to taking A-level. So basically, Aston University wants 75%. You'll note that they want 70% overall in biology and chemistry. You must do the UCAT test. Again, Julian will talk about that later. And you must apply by the competitive deadline, 15th of October. Notice the IELTS is 7.0, slightly lower than it has been in the past. And for the interviews, they will do multi-mini interviews. And again, Julian will cover those later. The UCLan, University of Central Lancashire, uh, wants 70%. And again, they want 70% overall in biology and chemistry, no UCAT, and you can actually apply up to May if you're a tier four student via UCAS. Although if you are an EU student, you must apply by the 15th of October. Again, they want 7.0 overall in all elements. And again, they interview using the multi mini interview technique. St George's University in Grenada. Now this university is actually split between the UK, between Northumbria University, which is near Newcastle in the north of England, and St George's in Grenada, which is in the uh, West Indies. Now, the percentage required for that course is 75%. Again, you need 70% overall in biology and chemistry. There's no UCAT. And you can apply up to August for students directly it's not through UCAS this is direct application so you can still be applying now to join in September or their January start for St George's now again IELTS is a little bit more flexible here 7.0 overall with a minimum of 6.5 in any, in any element now the process for application is different you do a, a direct application you need two referees which can both be provided by the college and you have an interview with a graduate doctor. Now, we have had the partnership with uh, St. George's just for a couple of years, but three of our students have now got places dependent on their final results at St. George's, all three who have applied, which is very, very good. OK, let's look at the next slide now. And let's talk about the main sort of advantages and disadvantages of the pathway. So one of the main advantages is that you can lead on from any previous year of level three study. So if you have done A level in year one, then you could switch to this program in year two. And that means that if A level hasn't gone as well as you'd hoped, you've got a safety net, there's another way forward for you. And I would say that a number of the students, around half the students on the foundation at Abbey College Manchester have done A level in year one. And then the other half are direct into the programme from their home country uh, because they've already done a level three study year in their own country. Now, what I would say is in terms of a visa, you, would need, you do need a tier four general visa to do international foundation programme. So if you have a child visa, you will need to switch that visa. Again, as Julian said, it is not difficult. It's very straightforward. It can be done in this country or at home. And, you know, there's a lot of support for doing that. And we have never had a visa refusal for such a thing. OK, the other advantage of the International Foundation, as I said before, it's very accessible in that it has built in support for language. A-levels are designed for, you know, British students, for native speakers, and they do not take into account second language in the same way that the Foundation programme does. But throughout the course, you are developing your English because again, you have to reach the level of IELTS that's required. We have very comprehensive preparation, the same as for A-level students. And the other major advantage of this is, yes, there are three universities for medicine, 
but you can use the qualification to apply for many other courses in the UK at almost all other universities. So you could do pharmacy at Newcastle, pharmacy at Manchester, biomedical sciences at Sheffield, neurosciences at Edinburgh. There is a huge range of courses you can apply for with this as well as your medical applications. Because as Julian will describe later, every medic needs a backup plan. And if you do not succeed getting into medicine the first time, because let's face it, only 7% of people do, although the percentage at our colleges is much higher, then you do need a backup plan. And if you do something like biomedical sciences, you can then go into a postgraduate entry for medicine. The main disadvantages I've outlined already is that this programme is mainly accepted in the UK. You can use international foundation abroad, and I have had students go to other universities in other countries, but that would have to be case by case basis. And of course, you, you have three medical schools only rather than the full pool of medical schools to apply for. OK, let's have a look now at the entrance criteria for the programme. So you must be 17 on the 31st of August of the year of entry because medical schools require you to be 18 to start studying. Almost all do. You need to have GCSE or high school equivalent with good grades in science. You need to have undertaken one year of level three study in science, be that A level in the UK, be that AS level or equivalent in your home country. To join the programme, you need IELTS 6.5 with no element less than six. I mean, I am prepared to look at individual cases on that, but it is important that the IELTS is enough to tackle the programme. You must be willing to undertake rele relevant voluntary experience and research in the health sector as part of the preparation programme. Now, we understand that during lockdown, it's not been possible to do live hands on voluntary work. But Julian will point you in some directions on how you can develop those skills uh, in terms of your preparation. As I've said, we'll look at individual cases, but this is a highly successful programme. It reduces the risk and the outcomes of this programme are very strong indeed. I'm going to hand back to Julian now. Thank you very much. Lovely. Thank you, Liz, talking us through the foundation route there. Great. So remember, there, there are two broad routes, that A-level route um, or this uh, international foundation route that Liz has just described. OK, so now we're looking at um, how do you actually get in? You've got these routes, so we know what, where that will take you, the university, the foundation years, and then after the foundation years, that specialist training. How do you actually get in though? So as Liz mentioned there, it's a small percentage of students that want to get into medical school that actually do get in. Um, and it's quite a scary small percentage. You must be thinking, golly, I, did, I didn't realise it was that tough. Yeah, it is that tough, actually. Um, however, um, both of our schools were set up for this purpose. So we have this 25 year and 30 year pedigree, if you like, of thinking hard about how to help medical students get in. Um, so we've got a lot of uh, additional um, opportunities, lots of uh, experience that we gained in that time, which we now use. So let me give you a bit of an overview about how we deliver our courses. So the way that we teach, well, we teach in classes. So you can see it's, it's an average um, around seven to 10 students. Um, the people that teach the classes though, this is quite interesting. So <clears throat> we're now talking of the fundamentals of being a student studying an A-level course or a foundation course in one of our colleges. The teacher in front of you will be teaching you, maybe six other students. That's an extraordinary opportunity to be in a class that small because that teacher will not be thinking, how can I communicate to this class of 30, which is the average class size really in the UK, or, or 40 or 50, where I, I know in some, some schools in other countries, class size can be much larger. Imagine being a class with just six other students or seven other students or eight other students. And imagine that those students are trying to get to medical school or maybe the London School of Economics or Imperial, or they're trying to get to Cambridge University. In other words, you'll be sitting with students in these lessons who are like you. And that means that there is an ambition and an enterprise in that room where people are trying to keep pushing up 
and get the best grades possible. The teachers in that room understand this. They know, for the, for the eight students in front of them, they know what they need, they know their backgrounds, and very quickly that teacher will get to know you, what you are strong at. When you submit homework, the teacher has only eight pieces to mark, so they will remember very clearly all the things you did right, and perhaps even more helpfully, all the things you didn't do right. That's how you learn, by a teacher saying, let me give you your homework back and let me show you in particular how you can improve. That's what we're offering in our, in our colleges, is that individual help to learn. Okay. We have a, a broad range of nationalities. Uh, my school in Cambridge, it's almost all international students. This is something I have um, decided year, years ago now, actually, to become a specialist international school. So this is what we do. We have students from at least 45 countries. So it's, uh, there's a real buzz about the place, about living and studying within the international community. In Liz's college, they've also got a cohort of, of students from the local area. So students from Manchester and the surrounding area so it's an opportunity for you to meet and study with local British, British students as well. The features of our schools well I mentioned the pedigree is medicine that's where we started since then we have been reflective we think how can we help you best I'll talk about that in a second but it does mean that we've innovated so there's a football program in Manchester we've created these foundation courses and the outcomes the most important part of all, perhaps, are incredibly strong. So in my school last year, 71% of the grades at A-level were A-star and A. That's extraordinary. That's what you need for your ambition for medical school, those kinds of grades. So you can see, because of the small classes, the inspiring teachers who will get to know you and the overall ambition in our schools, outcomes are very high. Okay. Let's talk about getting into medical school. So you know the routes, you know the options for the academic programme, A-level foundation. You know that you'll be well cared for in the classroom, small classes, ambitious students, amazing teachers giving you individual help. How do you get into medical school? How do you become one of those that gets in rather than the majority who are not successful? This is where our experience comes in and our knowledge of what the medical schools want. Okay, so we've actually created a programme for you to join when you, when you join our schools. So we think of it almost like another A-level. So you might do your biology, chemistry, maths, perhaps you do a fourth A-level to start with. Maybe you're studying English, perhaps. Uh, if your IELTS is not 7.5, we will give you English lessons. Then as another element of your course, Medical, me medicine preparation is another course. This is how important it is for us in our schools. We've created a standalone course. This course has been in existence for many, many years because that's our history. We've been doing our medical preparation courses since we were founded. They've got better, they've got longer, they've got more successful over time so successful we've actually created the same program for other subjects now we have one for law for engineering for natural sciences for psychology for art and so on based on this medical preparation course what does it involve well it involves you being supported in a timetable class in year 12. so if you join for your a level program you apply at the beginning of year 13 if you're a foundation student, you are joining year 13, so you apply at the start of your foundation course. So for an A-level student in year 12, we have a full academic year to give you medical preparation. Okay, what preparation do you need? Well, this is the, the big question. How do you convince a medical school to accept you and not somebody else? Well, you have to have good grades. We've talked about that. You need to be on track for A and A star for A levels, 70% for your foundation. You need to have advanced level English. Okay, that's fine. But it's not enough because there'll be other students who have all of those things as well. So how do you make sure you get the place and not the other student? In other words, it's a competition now. Now, in the UK, the system 
is not based on purely your grades. So in some countries, university admissions is all about your exam grade. If you get a very high grade, you can go to this university. If it's a bit lower, you go to that university. In the UK, exam grades are part of it. If you like, you have to have A and A star. If you've got them, you qualify for consideration to whether they accept you or not. It's still competitive. How do you convince them? Well, you have to apply with a very strong application at the beginning of year 13. What is a strong application? That's the question. And that is what we spend your year 12 working on, creating a strong application. You don't spend year 12 writing it. We don't give you a piece of paper at the start and say, well, start a first draft and we'll improve it over 12 months. No. Instead, in this medical preparation course, we will help you learn more about medicine. That's the secret here. You've got to be prepared by learning genuinely and deeply more about what doctors do. What that means when you do apply in the year 13, you've had 12 months of thinking and observing and reading and talking to doctors. So you will be able to write a stronger application because of that experience. So that's what this course is doing. It's building genuine medical experience. Some of that you might be already getting, and I hope you are, by going to see doctors yourself, work experience. As Liz has said, that's difficult right now, but not impossible. There's a virtual work experience I can talk about later. So work experience is crucial because it's experience that you need to get, seeing the real world of medicine. You then need to be able to explore your, the ideas you've come across through reading. So you can see in the bottom of your screen, there's one of the books from our course. We have a reading list. There's about 24 medical books that we would, we would suggest you look at. Maybe you look at four or five of these. We will help you choose from our reading list. We'll give you this reading list before you join, actually, for you to get started. And we do some guided reading through these books to, to explore medical issues. On a weekly basis, you'll be talking to the other students in the school. So we form this medical group and you'll be creating presentations. So you'll be doing research. We'll be inviting doctors to come into school. So you'll get to talk to the local GPs in the area. You'll be doing um, uh, projects to share with the class and you'll be doing investigations, you'll be receiving lectures, you'll be working on interview technique and studying ethics of medicine. It goes on and on and on. So it's like another A-level course in year 12, okay? So um, this gives you a little bit more detail. So if you just whiz through the red things, we help you get work experience. We have got many connections with hospitals and clinics. We help you with the medical entry exams, interview training and reading. There's a lot of preparation that you will be expected to do. But if you want to get into medical school, you have to be dedicated to this and you've got to genuinely want to get in. You have to have the ambition required because it's, it's going to be hard. We're going to ask quite a lot of you in year 12 when you're working through this. So let's have a quick think about work experience. Why do you do work experience? The key word there is experience to see what happens. So you can think, ah, now that I've seen the surgeon do the operation, I think I understand something more about medicine now. Or now that I've seen the nurses, I've seen a nurse work every day for the past seven days, and I think I have a better understanding of the qualities that she has, the difficulties, the challenges. So work experience is about you developing stories about medicine that you learned you have learned. I can't teach you those things. You have to see them. You have to be brave and speak to the consultants and ask them, you know, why did you do that? What are the challenges? So you're seeing it. Okay, that's work experience. With all of the work you're doing, I use the word experience because we're going to help you with the reading, with project work and with, with, with giving account of yourself by, by, by doing um, presentations to your class. Throughout all of this, you're gaining these stories. So the ultimate aim of this first year course that you'll do with us alongside A-Level is for you to gain paragraphs, perhaps. You can think of them that way. 
paragraphs of insights, things you know about medicine. Perhaps one of your insights is how the surgeon uh, operated his team when you saw that yourself. Perhaps another insight was about how antibiotics are used and perhaps you saw it, you talked to a, a GP about that and you read a book about this. Another insight perhaps could be about the functioning of the British healthcare system, the NHS, our National Health Service. Perhaps you talk to junior doctors about the NHS and you have some insights about that. So you can see there's no book that will give you all of this. You have to find it in order to tell your story at the beginning of year 13 about why you want to get to medical school. It is personal. Our courses structure this for you. So we give you the reading, we help you with work experience, but most importantly, we are helping you understand why you're doing these things, what the point of it all is. So that's what our courses are for. A lot of the work we do in the beginning of year 13, so you've now got these insights, you've had work experience, you've given talks, you've met doctors, you've had interview training, the beginning of year 13, we will then give you individual one-to-one -one help writing your personal statement, which is the statement on your application. So you write a statement, one of the team of medical teachers, in, in my school I lead that team, we will be looking at it and we'll be giving you critique, we'll be saying well why don't you think about this, have you thought about this? So you get individual feedback, then you spend a couple of days changing it, you come back and we give more feedback and again and again and again. And your statement will evolve and get better and better because of that one-to-one -one feedback. You then send off the application and hopefully the universities receive it and they think, wow, this student's fantastic. Very high grades, good English and a great application. This person's serious about medicine. They've got lots of experience that they've learned from. We should get them in and interview them. And that's the next stage, interview. Interviews um, can either be Traditional. Traditional interview means you'll be sitting behind a desk and there'll be people in front of you asking you questions. That's what you'd expect from an interview. Maybe it's three people, maybe four. There could be uh, one of the students, one of the undergraduates on the table. There could be one of the doctors who works in admissions this year. Could be a senior consultant. So very informed, intelligent people asking you questions about why you want to be a doctor. That's the first question to prepare for, it's a very hard one. They may also ask you questions about what you've done in the past, what you've learned, how you cope with difficult situations. They may give you a difficult situation. So this is a, if you like, it's a job interview, really. That, it has that format. There's the other kind of interview you have these days is called MMI, multiple mini interview, which is exactly that. Multiple, so many, mini, small interviews. Many, small interviews. So you have lots of small separate interview stations and you move between them. One of them may be an actor is there playing a patient and you have to uh, try and get a case history from the patient with, with somebody watching, making notes. The next station could be an academic problem. It could be some science problem to solve. The next one could be an ethical dilemma. So we do a lot of ethics of medicine training. The one after that, um, perhaps it's a teamwork exercise. So this time it's five of you working together to solve a problem. So you can see each of the multiple mini interview stages is looking for a different quality that that university wants you to demonstrate to show that you could be a good doctor. Preparation, previous experience is the key to all of this. That's what our business is. Okay. I should also mention that you will be asked to sit another examination beyond A level of foundation. There's an examination called BMAT or UCAT. So there's two different exams. They're medical entry preparation exams. And as you might expect, that is what we do in year 12. In year 12, we work on practicing our um, university entrance. So in, in my school, the way the structure works in the first term, you'll be talking individually to a tutor about the medic preparation. The tutor will be saying, so let's have a look at the, at the checklist, work experience, how do we organize that? Reading, what are you doing? So there's a one-to-one -one consultation and we meet once a week. In the second and third term of year 12 in my school, we meet twice a week and you have two sets of, of seminars running each week for six weeks. 
One of them could be on the UK CAT exam, one on medical ethics, one on the health system, one on interview technique, and so on. So modules like a course. Okay. Just as a, as a final point about preparation, um, we're very fortunate in, in my school, my staff are uh, very fired up to help you. And we've instigated academic enrichment in the evenings in Abbey Cambridge. So as a boarding school in, in Abbey Manchester, Cambridge, or in our sister in London, um, we, we have extra curricula. So we have sport activities, of, as you'd expect in a good school. You can play soccer, you can play netball, basketball, swimming, uh, volleyball, we have dance, yoga, all kinds of activities happen in our school. There's drama, music, art clubs, debate clubs. We also have academic clubs. We call it Abbey Inspires. And so in the evening, you can gain even more experiences, sometimes directly from doctors. Some of our doctors come in in the evenings, but it might be a talk from our psychology teacher. So we have the most amazing psychology teacher and she would give you a talk perhaps on placebo. So placebo is a medical topic, it's a very important medical topic, but she will talk about it from the point of view of a psychologist. What is the psychology of placebo? So you can see throughout year 12 particularly, you're picking up experience of what the world of medicine is like. And then in year 13, we'll help you put those together and make an extraordinary application to university and also train you for those interviews. Okay, that's what we would like to do with you. If you'd, if you'd like to come and join one of our schools, we'd love to help you. However, you should be doing something now. I would suggest think about preparation right now. Preparing for medical school is different, I think, to pretty much all other degrees. I would say medicine, uh, perhaps dentistry and veterinary science to be a vet are three degrees that require more from you before than almost any other. So I would suggest you prepare now. And you can see there, very simply, read, observe, think. Okay, what could you read? Well, I mentioned a reading list. So our students have this long reading list of books that we think are suitable for them to prepare for a medical application. But there's a huge amount of information out there. So in the UK, um, a very good source of news is the BBC. The BBC has a fantastic website and in one of the menus you will see health and you can then read about health stories for free on the BBC's website. Or you could go to another website in the UK, uh, perhaps one of the newspapers. There's a newspaper called The Guardian or a newspaper called The Telegraph, The Times. Um, some of them have paywalls, but The Guardian does not and the BBC does not. So they are free accessible materials. Also free is the NHS website. Remember that's the National Health Service. That's how we deliver health in the UK. The UK's health service is centrally funded. In other words, we pay tax, the government spends the tax on the health system. When we use the health system, therefore we don't pay because we've paid in our tax. So it's what we call free at the point of use. This is a system that in this country, it's thought of very highly. We like this system, so it's, it's very fondly regarded our national health service. So you will be educated in a hospital run by the National Health Service. So if you're successful in getting into medical school, the hospital will be NHS. So the people that will be training you work for the NHS. So it seems very important that you should learn about the NHS. How do we operate health in the UK? As an international student, you may know nothing about that. Well, now will be a good time to start learning more. Have a look around the website, try and understand what the health service does, how it works. And then reading. I would suggest a good book to read would be a book by a junior doctor. There are lots of those now. Um, again, on our reading list, we have many, many different kinds of memoirs. They're called diaries and also books of general medical interest. Um, there's a huge amount out there. In the, in the recent times, the last 10 years, a lot more books have been published for general interest about medicine because people are interested perhaps in about cancer therapies, the latest on antibiotics, perhaps care of the elderly, uh, Alzheimer's, genetic illness. There's a lot of information that people in the UK are interested in, so people buy books on that. Okay, observe. Okay, I've cut out a statement 
from um, a medical university. So this is what they expect you to have done. So the first bullet point is had people focused experience of care, health, and you understand the realities. So that means people focused experience. In other words, work experience. See the people do this. Second bullet point is you've developed some of the attitudes of a doctor. So the second bullet point really, and the third bullet point, I suppose, is you are becoming like a doctor. You're thinking like a doctor, you're reacting like a doctor. You're developing values, attitudes, and behaviors. That's something again, will help you when you're writing your statement, you to show that you have those because of what you've seen. Now, in terms of observing, work experience is difficult right now, we understand. There is an opportunity, however, to do virtual work experience. In other words, to do it on the screen. Now, you won't on the screen see real patients live, it's not that experience, but you'll be able to go through some of the issues that you might see in real work experience. And if that's of interest to you, um, it's a university called Brighton and Sussex Medical School. If you Google BSMS, Brighton Sussex Medical School, perhaps we'll type that in. I didn't put it on this uh, presentation. Um, they will have a work experience that you can do on the screen a virtual work experience in Brighton and Sussex Medical School, BSMS. Okay, think. Well, I would strongly recommend you keep how to get into medical school diary. So when you have work experience, when you've read an article on the NHS website, where you've thought about the health system in your country, maybe, Perhaps you have a relative who's a doctor or a friend who's a doctor or, a, or you can get in and speak to a doctor now. What did you learn from that? Write it down. Keep a diary because you may need that information in October this year. If you're a year 13 student, you may need it in October next year. So you might forget. Keep a diary and reflect. Reflect about what it is you're learning. How does this show that I'm really keen on medical school? Okay, so in summary then, you've seen the, the routes through, you've seen the A-level or foundation route, and then to win a place, you have to have these experiences that you can talk about and structure them so that you appear like a very keen junior doctor, because by thir year 13, that's what you are. Those experiences have helped you to think and talk and behave like a junior doctor. Okay, I'm going to finish off the talk by showing you last year, 2019, just to give you a bit of an insight into some of the students uh, in my school, that's Abbey College, uh, Cambridge there, and some of the universities that they went to, in fact, where the countries they're from. So you can see, I mentioned uh, Abbey College, Cambridge International School. So you can see students there from Iran, Malaysia, Myanmar, Taiwan, Poland, uh, the United Kingdom, Singapore. So from many, many countries. And you can see the universities they've gone to are universities in England, such as Aston, somebody went to Malaysia, a university in Scotland, that's Glasgow, uh, Poland, uh, Rocklaw, and Rocklaw, and uh, also University of Cambridge. There we are. Um, top medical school in the country, I think you probably argue, very hard to get into, um, and Bristol and so on. So students getting into universities all over the world, um, a lot in, uh, in England uh, and Scotland, but also includes Cambridge University, extraordinary achievement. So it can be done. Take hope from this slide and be inspired that these students were exactly in your position some years ago, wondering how on earth they would do it. They're now studying medicine in their first year. And for Liz, you can see that she's got a list of students from last year as well um, that have gone to, as you can see there, UK universities. Note UCLan, Aston, those are the universities accessible through that foundation course. And also Imperial College, another very highly ranked university, and Bristol. So that's just from the two schools uh, last year. So I have, have reached the end of this talk. Thank you so much for listening. I hope it's been useful. And thank you so much to, to Liz for talking with her expertise on foundation. 
our ambition is to inform we are educators that's why we choose to work in schools so there we are you can see the pictures of our three schools there i am now going to see if we have any questions so perhaps john menzies I do. hello, hello. Um, thank you guys for providing an amazing session very informative um we have a few questions um uh, and please do post your questions in the chat and i'll put those to julian and liz in real time um before we go into the questions um julian mentioned the virtual work experience i have put a link to 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 that program in the chat so do have a look at that if you're interested um the first couple of questions I'm going to group together, um, and they're for Liz, um, relating to um, foundation. Rebecca and Tatiana have asked a couple of questions, um, just for clarifications on which um, universities um, the IFP gives access to, which I think you <coughs> you guys have covered. But then also Tatiana has followed up and said, um, if a student missed the required um, percentage score by three or four percent, would the university still consider them? So maybe that's something Liz can can respond to on. Uh, unfortunately, no you do need to reach the threshold score of 70 or 75 percent however we aim for the students to get much higher than that so typically strong students will be scoring 85 percent on the program uh, no they do have a threshold and if you don't meet the score then you won't be able to get into the school however obviously the reset uh, opportunity of the unit one or two up to two units in the june exam series does give more uh, scope for that and because we track the score very carefully as you go along you can see exactly where you're at and exactly where the development areas need to be so you know it is does give more flexibility in that sense than an a level brilliant thank you liz um and svetlana just said thank you for a very uh, informative session no problem at all svetlana um we have have one question here um We've been asked, um, is it possible to specialise uh, to be a doctor working in laboratories and investigations? So I guess that's probably around career development and, and how that would work. Yes. Yeah, it is. So um, you can qualify after your five years um, and you can then work in science, effectively become a research scientist. Um, or you can do that after your foundation or indeed after your specialism. So, you know, you are a valued, um, highly skilled employee at that point um, in great demand. You know, there's a shortage of doctors. There's a shortage of good scientists all over the world. Um, we know that science brings innovation and all countries are looking for that these days. Um, I would question whether a student who is looking at a research route is looking at the right degree. Um, to get into medical school, you really must want to work as a doctor. Otherwise, it's very hard to convince the, 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 the medical school that, that it's the right course for you. Because if you want to be a research scientist, and I speak as a former research scientist, I, I have a PhD and I worked in industry for, for a time. If you want that life, then perhaps should be looking at that degree, perhaps a pure science degree. The reason being, you'll go further with that science than if you were studying for a medical degree. So a medical degree obviously is a, a scientific degree, but also it's a degree about working and caring and diagnosing. Whereas a science degree, you push in greater depth towards the end of the degree that, than is possible with a medical degree. Um, so I would just question which route at the start, but once you've qualified as a doctor, the world, as we say, is your oyster. In other words, you have many, many choices. You're highly employable and you can move. You know, we've had doctors retrain. Um, doctors, after they've qualified, become lawyers. Um, in this country, we've had doctors becoming cabinet ministers, becoming politicians. So you're a highly skilled individual at that point, very much in demand. Thank you, Julian. Um, Tatiana's asked a question just about the potential to transition from say a levels into foundation um and she's asked kind of you know um, are they is it considered a retake and does that mean that there are any issues with visa applications so i mean i think maybe just a little bit more on kind of how that that transition might occur and sure. what the implications are okay yeah it's, it's a good question it's um it's not uncommon so um in, in all three colleges uh, students uh, often join in year 12 for a level for a two-year a level course and in the first year, uh, we look at their progress. In my school, we look at this every six weeks at a senior level. So my vice principal 
with the house masters and other academic staff look at outcomes about every half term um, and we we work with the student and their tutor plotting the course through through, uh, through the college is, is a level the right route or actually should we transfer to foundation for year 13 that's common we have a number of students that do this and there's no problem at all with universities if you applied for um, a medical university after doing year 12 a level moving to year 13 foundation it doesn't um, uh, impact negatively at all um, on the uh, choices ahead of you um, so you're not considered a, a, a retake student because you're not retaking i would go further and say for foundation direct entry from year 11 is not advised because foundation is a year 13 program so it's a little harder than year 12 so often a good route through is actually to do year 12 and then do year 13 foundation um, that's um, something i think that we find students do very well if they do the year 12 first in terms of changing your visa um, it's a technicality that we will help you with um, we have students who join us in September on their tier four child and we help them reapply. The minute you send off your application, you're permitted to study on your course. So again, I think that's a technicality moving from tier four child to tier four general. And to add to that, Julian, I think if you have taken the full A-level programme over two years, then you would be considered a research student. So you've got the option if you're able to extend your visa and you'll not be on the cap of resetting your A-levels or you could do the International Foundation programme and I know that you clan are open to that but I always say to students you must contact the university and check with the admissions tutor about your particular situation. We can help you with that but it's always wise to get exactly what the university says in writing. Um, you know if you had completed a full A-level programme and I think that's another possibility in, in the question that was asked thank you thanks Liz thanks Julian uh, that's great um Saeed has just asked um are there options for students to study nursing or dentistry um within the UK um and and, and he, was, he was kind of asking that if, if if they don't get a place in medical school well if I can just talk from the foundation point of view first um dentistry you cannot get into with the international foundation program um, that is for medicine only. But as I described earlier, if you're on the foundation programme, then you can apply for lots of other courses and nursing would be one of those. Uh, you know, so that would be fine. Um, I think Julian probably talked a bit more about A-level, but what I would say is dentistry is just as difficult to get into as medicine. So in, in many ways, you've got to make a decision which you want to apply for and one of them isn't easier than the other. Um, you know, that, that's really kind of critical to understand. Yeah, just, just to um, add to that point, um, dentistry, medicine and veterinary medicine, to be a vet, those three are classed together in terms of difficulty. In other words, they are very difficult to gain entry for, so you have to get good grades. Um, a and A star for those, uh, uh, for A level. A level actually gives you access to pretty much everything. It'll allow you to go to any university in the UK, any course in the UK. Nursing in the UK is a degree profession now. In other words, to get into nursing, you have to have a nursing degree. A nursing degree is easier to get into than a medical degree, as you can imagine. The academic entry requirement is necessarily lower. Dentistry isn't. Dentistry is a hard qualification. And, you know, we, we need to accept that I think we want our doctors and our dentists to be highly qualified and to be able to get A's and A stars. That's what this course is. It is a high level academic course. And so you have to be able to reach the high level academics uh, in order to be successful in gaining a place at those courses. Thank you, Julian. So, so, so I suppose a student should really focus quite early in terms of whether they want to do dentistry versus medicine uh, rather than keeping their options open. You know, I, I, I'm not too concerned about that because, you know, I mentioned in year 12, we, we work on preparation. So I have dentists and medics um, working on the same kind of work. They might be reading some of the same books. At, during that year 12, you need to decide you can't apply to both 
because if you apply to both, the universities will say, well, I'm not sure you're suitable to become a dentist because you talk medicine. And the medical school will have the same view. Well, you're talking about dentistry, so I'm not taking you. So you need to come to the conclusion. I would say in, in year 12, if not before, um, a good way to do that is work experience. You know, is actually go, go and see doctors and dentists when that's opened up again or read books about them and actually find out, you know, well, what is the difference? Um, why do I want one or the other? Um, and we will help you with that in year 12. But by year 13, when you write your application, you must be absolutely committed to one or the other. On that point, Liz mentioned a plan B. So it's useful to have an alternative in case you don't get into medical school. If you apply for medicine or dentistry, you would go full-blooded into that and you would write dedicated statement about that. But you can use that to apply also to related courses. So you're allowed five university options when you apply to the central process. Four can be medical schools or dental schools. So there's one space left. So you could put a related course down and that university will probably make you an offer because if you've got to that point, you're probably quite a strong student. So a related course could be biomedical science, for example, which going back to the previous question, biomedical science is not a bad degree if you want to become a research scientist in the medical field. And as it happens in the UK, we are one of the strongest uh, economies in terms of biomedical research. Um, you may have heard of some of the vaccines. There's a number of leading universities, such as Oxford University, working on a coronavirus right now, for example. So you'll find this world of bioscience, biomedical science. Britain is actually world leading. Brilliant. Thank you, Julian. Um, we've had a question from Svetlana. Um, she's just asked, um, it, how, how common is it for students to join uh, medical schools in Europe or outside of the UK after A-levels and IFP? And, and how is that process kind of managed? Yeah, I mean, it is common. Um, and a lot of students will apply for both. They may apply in the UK and they may apply abroad. Now, the requirements for a lot of the European universities are slightly lower. So you would have slightly lower grades and you can also do an entrance, you have to do an entrance exam. So some of the students for whom you may not be able to support a UK application because they're not A star A students, um, they could still apply for a European medical school. Uh, and that is common. It's a separate application. Each one is its own application process and it is not through UCAS. So, you know, I suppose if you're looking at this in the broadest sense, you could have five applications in UCAS of which four can be for medicine. You can have one, the fifth one has to be something else like biomedical science. You could apply to some universities in Ireland separately and in, you could apply to some universities in Europe separately and St. George's separately because St. George's will take um, A-levels as well. What I would say is that the application process itself, as you can appreciate from everything Julian said, is like doing a fourth A-level on its own. It's like a whole unit to itself, just the application. And what you've got to do is not spread yourself too thinly doing too many applications when that's very time consuming. And actually you need to be concentrating still on your actual academic studies. So I think it's very important to take advice from your, you know, from your mentors, from your teachers about what the best route for you is. Because what you want to do is reduce the risk. If you want to do medicine, then you want to do it at the place you can get into. You can't necessarily be so choosy. You've got to think, I want to be a doctor and I'm going to be prepared to go to a medical school. Maybe I haven't thought of because that's what I want to do. Because the standards in them obviously have to be consistent in order to qualify. Thank you. And I've, um, I've put the slide back up for... Um the students going to university from Abbey Cambridge last year. Just to illustrate the point there, you can see, so Aston is in England, you've got Malaysia, uh, Glasgow is in Scotland, uh, Rocklaw is Poland, Cambridge is next door to my college, uh, Bristol is in England, you've got the Polish University, Trakia is in um, um, Bulgaria, I think it was. Um, uh, Trinity College is in uh, Dublin, in Ireland, Belgrade in Serbia, and another one in Ireland. So you can see there's a full spectrum there of uh, universities from different countries. The approach that we take is we take every student 
as an individual. So they get individual help with application for the British universities. They get individual help with any other universities they apply to. So I have a team of medic specialists and UCAS specialists, actually. So the UCAS specialists will be driving and going, well, how's it getting on? What, what have you applied to a UK university you have? What about the university in Serbia? Have you applied to that? What about the Grenada University we know of? What about Ireland? So we're, we're making sure we give you as many options as possible because it's hard. We wanna, wanna make sure you get in. So you may not just be applying to four UK universities. You may be applying to five UK universities at one outside of UCAS, so UCLAN. Perhaps you also would apply to the Royal College of Surgeons in Ireland and Trinity College in Dublin. Perhaps you apply also to Grenada, to a Polish university, to a Serbian. You could be applying to 10 universities with us and maybe, maybe one of them, two of them, three of them will accept you. So that's the approach. Committed students will work with you to apply to all the universities and we will guide you to make sure that if you really are desperate to get to medical school, brilliant, we're going to get you in. But you can see there just the work that it takes. But don't worry, that's, you know, this is what our, our, our colleges are for, remember, we were established for this. So we have the staff, we have the expertise, we've got the connections, so we're ready to help you apply to the universities that you need to apply to, to become a doctor. Thank you, Julian. Thank you, Liz. Um, I think that's kind of all the questions dealt with that we've had. If anyone does have any final questions, please post them now. Um, otherwise, um, when we send you the slides, when we send you the video, um, please respond if you have any questions that come up and we'll put those to Julian, to Liz, to the teams at the colleges as well. If anyone does have any final questions, post them. Um, I think we are all questioned out. So um, I'll let you guys say goodbye and then I'll sign things off. Okay, well, thank you very much for listening. I hope it's been informative and bye from me in Manchester. All the very best. Uh, thank you for listening. Um, again, I hope it was useful to you. Um, all the very best and good luck. Bye bye. Thank you very much, guys. Thank you, Tatiana, for the, for the kind words. Have a lovely afternoon or evening wherever you are. Goodbye.